Hello friends, peers, colleagues, and everyone else. Uh, welcome to Critical Praxis. Today is Monday, week number two. This week's topic is set by me. Uh, I am interested, or at least I'm having the readers read, an article called The Normalization of Queer Theory by David M. Halperin. And I'll have that citation below in the description box. This article, uh, in this article at least, uh, David Halperin outlines kind of this history of queer theory becoming a a skill set, a practice in the academy that has become more or less um, cleaved from the activist uh, underpinnings that it assumed or presumed at the beginning. And he really outlines, I think, a really fine, quick, easy way within five pages of what has happened to queer theory and his concerns that I certainly share with him, that ultimately queer theory as a tool of the academy of the university has become nothing more than a skill set for a lot of graduate students and practicing faculty as well. That as a skill set, there's a lot of problems inherent in that. And I believe that, and I'm hoping that others can also expand on this in their own disciplines and in their own theoretical models, but this also certainly has uh, some sort of impact for other cultural theoretical models, be they feminist, be they critical race theory, be they uh, queer theory, transgender theory, all of these different theories themselves and theoretical models, uh, that when we look at them as nothing more than a skill set, we run into some really big problems in terms of actually pulling ourselves away from the political impetus uh, and, and, and for, foregoing or rather foreclosing on the potential of engaging in critical consciousness development or critical pedagogy in everyday practices, be they in line at Starbucks, be they with students in classrooms, be it walking down the street or at a bar late at night, right? that this cannot be seen as that queer theory itself as a skill set ends up lending itself to just this practice in some sort of back room at the library uh, writing a paper where you're merely just critiquing an article and saying, I can do queer theory. But queer theory itself has this intricate connection to bodies, queer bodies, uh, gay, lesbian, bi, trans, uh, that, that, that certainly needs to be attended to, at least in my opinion, when dealing with queer theory. That when we pull the body away, this is where we have this sort of problematic where uh, the actual political stuff can uh, end up getting kind of erased, right? And the actual practice of queer theorizing or queer theoretical work. Uh, Halperin actually writes, um, I, I'm going to share three quotations that I think are rather uh, important. He writes, uh, these are all actually on page 343, and he writes, quote, but I would not want to teach such a course if it were to function as a means for straight students who do not wish to engage with queer culture or queer studies to acquire a qualification in queer theory merely so as to complete an up-to-date graduate education. This is a huge problem. Uh, not that straight or cis people cannot understand or learn queer theory. That's not the problem. And I, and I would argue that Halpern also doesn't see it as a problem. The problem comes in when queer theory is seen as, seen as something as a skill set where people, queer people, queer bodies, different bodies, be they same sex oriented or uh, transgendered or transsexual um, or what, 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 whatever that case may be, that the queer component or the person component gets kind of disjointed so that queer becomes nothing more than an actual academic exercise. And what this, end up, what this ends up leading down is this kind of practice where perhaps one can put it on a curriculum vitae that I do queer theory, but in practice, I don't know how to talk to or engage queer bodies. I'm afraid of queer bodies. I'm homophobic. I deal with transphobia. I don't know how to engage dialogues about HIV AIDS, uh, medication access. I don't understand the issues perplexing queer bodies themselves. All I know is that I can do queer theory. And I see this certainly as a problem. He also adds, this is the second quotation on the same page, students nowadays who enroll in graduate school intending to work in queer theory, whatever their political background or ambitions, seek less to revolutionize the university than to benefit from what the university, university currently has to offer them. Which I think uh, certainly speaks to these, this uh, kind of consumer model that a lot of universities are really learning to uh, unfortunately embrace. Uh, and I think that when we when we when we look at that model, that means that education needs to litter. It becomes this notion of what am I paying for? Am I getting what I'm paying for? As opposed to the non immediate benefits, right? That there's this the critical consciousness component is more beneficial than the potential paycheck of having something extensive on a CV. Of I can do queer theory. 
uh, as opposed to I have a consciousness that understands and engages in queer theoretical ways of seeing the world and in being in the world and is living the world in queer ways, in feminist ways, in critical race theoretical ways, what have you. And so that certainly becomes that problem. And he ends the article with this very key quote here, uh, quote, if queer theory is going to have the sort of future worth cherishing, we will have to find ways of renewing its radical potential. And by that I mean not devising some new and more avant-garde theoretical formulation of it, but quite concretely reinventing its capacity to startle, to surprise, to help us think what has not yet been thought. Now, I think that, uh, at least for my discipline, so I'll speak a little bit about communication studies and what I see here, is that queer theory uh, certainly has a space in performance studies, right? That in the field of performance studies, we certainly draw on a lot of, a number of scholars, performance scholars draw on, and performance artists draw on queer theory as these models of how to kind of get at uh, the performance of everyday as well as aesthetic performance, not that those are always necessarily mutually exclusive, certainly, but that in terms of startling, in terms of surprising, performance spaces and performance practices certainly offer the space to experiment with and to play with queer theory in an embodied way. Meaning that we actually work with and play with gender and sex without only seeing these things as mere performance, right? I don't want to go down that slippery slope, that's not what I'm tending here, but rather trying to startle audiences to rethinking certain things about different bodies. A performance that I'm certainly working on right now is a pedagogy of queer theory. That literally means how it is that I might learn to, or how I might teach queer theory to students as an embodied practice, an everyday practice of what it means to be queer, at least in my experience, as well as what it means to queer the world around us and to engage, be engaged in constant queering of spaces uh, from um, mundane tasks such as not uh, gendering one's partner, uh, gendering oneself in slippery ways, uh, uh, engaging in all sorts of whatever they may be radical sexual practices or engage in some sort of uh, practice where you start validating queer ways of being without blinking at that, right? But also acknowledging that some of those queer ways are in fact queer, even for the person who's listening to it. Um, conversely, I think that in intercultural communication, we also have an interesting vibrant space to talk about the ways that within the LGBTIQA uh, dot 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 alphabet train that in that space there's certainly space to talk about intercultural ways of communicating with one another within this larger uh, community or communities that uh, queer bodies are certainly a part of and also resistant to. I think broadening also even further is the necessary dialogues that, in, that intercultural communication deals with in terms of racialized uh, histories and trajectories that manifest themselves in these queer spaces. So I guess ultimately what I see here is that if we are going to, uh, to, to identify as queer theorists, as feminist theorists, as uh, uh, critical race theorists as some sort of cultural theorists out there that it cannot just be seen as a skill set that we do on a piece of paper but rather it has to become I guess a, a means of dialogue a constant embodied practice where we're pushing ourselves and other people to engage in critical consciousness development about the world around us and this will have to take place and begin and continue to take place I think in places that are not just the classroom I do believe in, and this is where I guess the backbone of this channel comes from, is uh, my belief in taking pedagogy out of the classroom and into the streets and into the sidewalks and into the churches and into libraries and what have you, even into your home, that we, also, that we understand that these are practices that are not just skill sets, but rather embodied ways of living the world. So what is a queer way of living the world through a communication lens? It's really understanding the powerful impact of our communicative words as constitutive components, um, that the way that we gender one another, the way that we sex one another has implications for the way that we start constructing and understanding our relations with people around us. So we need to start querying those by really radically rethinking how it is that we approach each other from a communication lens. Well, I guess that's a long way of really saying that I do not really believe in queer theory as a skill set. Not that I don't believe in it because it's a unicorn, because I do believe in unicorns, but that queer theory is a mere skill set without the actual queer bodies uh, engaged in these dialogues, or at least the awareness and critical engagement with queer bodies is problematic. And frankly, it runs the risk of erasing queer bodies and queer modes, and frankly is a homophobic and transphobic and queerphobic way of going about academia. And so I certainly beg that those who are identifying as feminist theorists, as queer theorists, as critical race theorists, are engaged in the actual bodies that these have uh, implications for. That there are actual bodies that are put on the line when we have these dialogues. And we need to remember who those bodies are, be they our bodies or other people's bodies that we're talking about. Anyways, I hope you all have a great week and I look forward to the other dialogues that this article brings up. Take care.